Good evening, everybody. Um, so when we were first talking about with Arjun what to speak upon, so this is an area that uh, is of uh, great uh, interest to me, mainly because I see organizations as team of teams. And going forward, you see that will happen more and more. Um, and when you think of organizations, one think of generally if you, if you type in organization into Google and just look at images, you'll see hierarchies, you know, somebody reported to somebody uh, and somebody else reporting something. I think that model is more or less dead or will be dead. And you find that organizations are essentially a network of teams and of conversations. So um, it is something that I've been researching upon, reading upon, writing upon, uh, learning. Practicing, of course. Um, and the topic that I've chosen is, is kind of a misnomer because when I said managing, or rather a contradiction, because it says managing teams and leading people in the social impact. Uh, typically, when one assumes management and the way management has been taught to us and practiced till now in organizations, corporate governments, NGOs as well, we find that the organization management means control. Uh, controlling people, controlling resources, controlling money, controlling time, controlling uh, processes, controlling method, controlling materials, and the likes. So it's idea of, of management is essentially control. And if you talk about leadership, it's the opposite. It's about let, letting go of control. So when you say that how do you manage a team? How do you lead people there? It, it kind of is a contradiction or can appear as a contradiction. Um, and, and this is something that, that most people will start now acknowledging that organizations that we see around today are more or less, are more or less uh, uh, relics of the past the practices that they follow the and i am I, I, a prime example I, I learned my management mostly in, in oracle uh, where i spent four or five years there and then it was a classical organization command and control organization and uh, i come from there to argum which was founded by roy nilkin and many of us from from, from corporate and what we practiced was a similar kind of command and control. Uh, and, and when you find that, and I've seen so many other nonprofits work in the same fashion, uh, and that's not really what works. More than what's right and wrong. Um, is it better now? Uh, who is this, Arjun? Can you hear me? It's better now, it's better, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so I think when you talk about organizations in general of the future, how to develop an organization of the future, I think it's going to be built on leadership rather than management, which means that a great team gets enabled, gets created rather than designed. I'll explain. So how, how does one, how does a team get formed? Usually a team is formed when somebody is assigned, few groups of individuals are assigned to one particular manager and they say, okay, why don't you do this? It could be, let's say, in, so in, came, okay, in the case of social impact organizations, it could be you have a fundraising team, you, you, have, you have what you call functional teams, you have fundraising teams, or you, if you have program teams, you, if you have, or you have um, voluntary management teams and things like that. So either they are designed functionally or could be designed cross-functionally as well. For example, you would say that I would have a, a team or a division in, in education, and then there are a bunch of people, they have their own, that department or team would have its own set of, um, uh, its own set of fundraisers, its own set of um, uh, program staff, uh, program project management staff, and things like that. So. Um, but I think these kind of uh, teams are, um, as I said it before, relics of the past. I don't think these things will exist uh, or at least the contradiction because most of the organizations are frankly very not very successful. You know? And uh, if one experiences, meaning my own experience, and if we just reflect upon our own experiences in work, we tend to do a lot of work that's actually quite wasted. Um, and then 
how and then at the most of these non-profit CEOs that I know are burnt out, frankly. Uh, you know, they've been doing work, things haven't moved, uh, the system is so complex, um, and they're frustrated. You know, the employees who are working there in organizations, they join with a lot of um, a lot of um, concern for people, for environment, for ecology, for for, for whatever the cause that they for animals for the whatever cause that they believe in they join in, and the 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 organization that they work for usually comes in the way of actually getting work done, um, and this is the shared experience of most of the people that are working in, and some organization may be different or some organizations initially might be different, um, so this is something that you know we've been discussing thinking about how can we change the nature of into problem, um, and then if you find on the internet and you read the books in general, you find a lot of uh, what I would say tips. You know, it's like heuristics that one follows, or hire a good team. Um, you know, uh, you say you you, know, you have team meetings. You you know you discuss. This is a certain kind of a certain flimsiness to the advice that I get. But I receive and I read and all, and then I find that most people, and I've been unable to implement most of the things that I read onto day-to-day life because in day-to-day work teams, day-to-day uh, patterns, and I've seen the same organized, same things that other leaders also find it difficult to do is because a team and an organization has a certain momentum, and the momentum just breezes through what you're trying to arrest and trying to do, uh, which is how uh, we've. Uh, been thinking and how we've been uh, evaluating what what do we do next, and um, one of the things that that uh, that I stumbled upon as we were doing that, and especially with as uh, Renuk was explaining that I was mentoring uh, the founders of online RTI, and I could see that in fashion that we could discuss a lot of things. We had a great meeting, great mentoring session, and they would go back, and then the finding it difficult to just do day-to-day work that, that they have to do. And then even trying to implement a couple of things that we discussed was just Herculean. And then they say, you know, what's, what's the heart of it? What is, what's not working? What is the way? Um, and then we stumbled upon the idea of a culture. Okay. Um, so to share my screen, it's, I've been... Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Should. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, Deepak, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so, if you look at it, so this is the idea of, you know, we've, um, most of organization culture tends to be a combination of one of these things, you know. Every team, every organization wants to do all of it very well. Um, but manages to do only a couple of things really well. Uh, so either the organization can be a very customer-focused organization, an employee-focused organization. I mean, if you find an employee organization, if, you, if I go for the for-profit world, you'd always find Richard Branson keep talking about the employees come first and not the customers. You know, And in a team, the team becomes big, innovation-focused organization. The innovation is always talked about more than the people or the customers actually using it. Achievement-focused organizations are more concerned about how they are doing well, either financially, rather than uh, they talk less about customers, about people, about teams, about innovation, but how well they, they are doing in financial terms. This is, comes from a corporate, um, I would say, um, research in that sense. What has been increasingly, increasingly, been recognized is a sixth pattern of organization culture archetypes. An archetype for people who may not understand the word is a pattern or a paradigm or a stereotype of, of, um, of what's out there. You know? So then one thing that got added lately is something called the greater good focus, which is what social impact organizations are about. They could be they could be organized themselves as nonprofit NGOs. They could be voluntary groups, community-based organizations. They could be social impact entrepreneurs. You know, there's there's a certain variety, but the impact, but the purpose, and the bias, the organizing culture bias is greater good. 
now. This is how one starts off. And as organization becomes older and older, it tends to acquire a certain a bias, at least one of the five things above. Okay. Um, and and that we don't know what it could be. It depends upon the leaders in the organization, depends upon the people who join the organization. So this culture is the way is the way things are or the way things become. And it is it's such a powerful force that anything new that gets tries to get added gets consumed with the momentum that I was talking to you earlier about or whatever, whatever is the organizer culture about. Now, can you create a culture which you really want? Uh, yes, but it is not really in your zone of control. You can, you can provide the input, but you're unsure what the output might look like. Okay. So you provide the input and what could the input that you provide so the culture could be that you know, or could tend to that. So, so that, is a, that is how culture tends to work. Uh, it's, it's habits reinforced by other habits with better team practices. Um, so what are the things that we can, we can do? So this is, uh, I've been uh, researching, you know, trying to, meaning there are so many symptoms of how do you know whether thing is working? Um, and we have, I mean, as a society, we have trained ourselves to always look for something that is not working. Uh, we do that to ourselves. Uh, we do that, you know, keep, we keep talking about, oh, this is the problem that we have. This is the, or we talk about other individuals. We don't know, I have this great guy working for me, but he is this, you know. We always trying to identify something that's not working rather than how it's working. And I've been training myself to think the opposite. So what are the, what, what, what are the symptoms of effective teams? And I would say a certain amount of achievement. They achieve something. And they can and do do it consistently. It could be, it could be something that uh, that they, they, for example, if it's in the social impact space, if they're trying to practice a particular, uh, they they implement projects very well, or they are very, they have very good. So they have very good output numbers, impact numbers, outcome outcome numbers, or whatever that whatever you want to see how you measure success as. Um, and behind that, it's a very clear purpose but that's common to everybody, you know? And they tend to, while they're trying to do this common purpose and achieve what they're trying to achieve, there is a certain bon homme, a togetherness, bonding, um, what in French is called as esprit de corps. And then that's how uh, there's, a certain, there's a certain sense of being, being together as a team. Um, and this is where the fourth point is ownership and responsibility. And I've always had this thing, meaning good teams, especially corporate teams, teams in corporates, uh, tends to have, tend to have a good role clarity, responsibility clarity. Um, um, uh, I'm not very really sure whether that really works in, 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 in social spaces or startups is that while you, it can become a role clarity could also become the boundary in which an individual tends to say, this is my role, I'm only going to do this. And uh, what would be preferable is ownership, responsibility, and concern for what you're working for. And then a tendency to roll up your sleeves and start working. Um, and the fifth item that I add is something that I've seen consistently in many nonprofits and many social impact space for me to say, this is a symptom of an effective team in a nonprofit, that there's empathy, the sense of fairness, and uh, when I meant democratic, meaning uh, it's more participative, that opinions are sought from people across the hierarchy. And I, for me, these are, the, these are the symptoms of effective teams in nonprofits. The four ones I would assume are common in most teams, irrespective of whether they are commercial or whether they're nonprofit. And the fifth, I think, is particularly um, important to many employees working in nonprofits. Uh, so this is this is where we are. For me, um, I think a team culture gets created, and cream culture gets created by the leader by showcasing these few traits that I see. And the more you practice, 
the more the team, the more the people will, res will respond. And when they respond, they also will start mimicking. And when they mimic, they will not only mimic with you, they will also mimic with the rest of the team. Okay. So let's start about it. The fairness, integrity, compassion. Um, so, and this is very different from the, these five things positive. I'll explain what all they are, but these are very different from how I would, I would put up a slide on say, managing your staff. You know, if you listen, if you read traditional management books, I mean, which are now outdated, but if you were to read from the 1980s and you would say, be strict with the people coming on time, people be, you know, be, be, uh, be give warning letters if they are not, uh, if, they are, if they are behaving inappropriately. There's a lot of control involved, okay? What is possible now is very different, is that today what is required is, is more fairness. So fairness is not being soft. Fairness is being that you have certain values and you stick to the values and they are applied consistently across everybody, irrespective of whether you personally get along well with them or not. Okay. Integrity is, is, is similar, uh, but it's more a moral compass. Um, compassion, fairness also got to do with salary levels. For example, mm -hmm. when I first joined ACO, I, I released the salary figures to everybody. Okay. Everybody should know what each other is making. Now, why we do we have to hide salary stuff? This is an example of it. It could be some. Why do we need, feel the need to hide salary structures? Is because they are completely inconsistent. Somebody is drawing very high. Somebody is drawing very low. Somebody bargained better, so they get a higher salary, and it's just ad hoc. You know. So being fair is to also explain to people why you are a, have a certain salary structure, what goes into identifying a salary for a particular position. And then we recreated that position and it was a problematic because some people's salaries were quite low. So then we had to change our salary. Some people were very high. So we had to stop the increment for some time and people understood. People were just trying, we were trying to create a fair system. Uh, integrity, but of having a moral fiber, a moral compass that you're consistent with. Um, compassion. Um, a lot of people will make mistakes in your organization, including yourself. Um, and and typically, when you, when people make mistakes, there's always a lot of blame giving that's happening in the organization, or there's a certain amount of, oh, you made five mistakes. There's a problem. It affects your improvement. It affects your appraisals. It affects all these things. Um, I would say that if you really want to work in uh, in today's world, you have to encourage mistakes because there can't be really any creativity happening if people don't make mistakes. And then once you make a mistake, they need to know that if they make a mistake, it, it's okay. You know, and how do you lead with compassion? How do you lead with, with kindness? And also, you know, people do something, some basic things very poorly. And sometimes, uh, sometimes leaders are very, very harsh on them, and and they respond that, and they, that your staff will mimic what you do. If you are, um, if you are compassionate, they will mimic your compassion. If you are arrogant, they will mimic your arrogance. You know. Uh, the second point is positive bias, which means that. Um, Instead of, let's say somebody has a point to make, and instead of saying, okay, that's a good point, but, but, however, that's not correct, is to always say, that's an interesting point. And this is what I want to add to your point. So something which is called a positive bias. Always have a bias toward the positivity in your own team and in the person around you. And that's what so defined as positive bias. There is an entire school of thought called appreciative inquiry, which only dwells into that. And, uh, and it is magical. For years that has not moved in, your people will move if you start practicing positive bias.
It is like, for example, you have, let's say for, for, for certain people, I'm just giving an example of a person who's, who's quite, quite good in his work or she's very good in her work, but she has, a, she has got a habit of being late you know, for meetings, let's say. That's the point. And you find all the time that people are always questioning, you know, why are you late? Or, or, or let's say, or I'll give a better example. So the quality of work is very good, but the person meets, doesn't meet deadlines. And the typical thing is to be very harsh on that person. And what usually happens when you're harsh on that person is that person goes into a defense mechanism. The, uh, and they start, they start doing things which are probably trying to protect, being insecure, being, being afraid, being not open, not transparent. On the other hand, if you were to just concentrate, oh, that's great work. Keep, keep talking about how good that person is in, their, in an area that is, and when you are sharing that thing, appreciation, it has to be genuine. You can't just fake it. You know, you know there's, there's always something good about everybody. So you don't have to really have to search. And then you start positive bias. You will see slowly, slowly, the person will start acknowledging herself or himself for what good they were. But they will also say, you know what? I wish I would have been able to submit it a week earlier. Okay. So say, and then you start talking to the person. Okay. What came in the way? What worked? You know, what usually is the process? And when you start doing that, the person, defense mechanisms are not, not uh, lit and they are, they can talk to you as an adult. Okay. Um, the third point is uh, many, many managers that I've seen don't trust their employees, don't trust their staff. Um, and I think there's a, there's a error. Uh, and the only way to come out of that error is actually to, to trust without inhibition, without worrying that things will go wrong. And you now, for example, I have put this, I mean, I could have easily put other things, but I said that the second point is, so I have a certain cycle in mind. You trust people, you ask people for what needs to get changed, listen to them, implement it, acknowledge it. Okay. For example, let's say your, our organization has a um, particular, let me give an example. Let's say funding. So let's say the organization um, has only three months of cash remaining in the organization. This is a typical nonprofit scenario that I find all the time is that when people come to me and ask for advice, I say, what do you want help on? They say, you know what, our funding is very poor. Uh, we only have three months of cash. Okay. So funding is, and funding, most people don't realize is a symptom of a problem rather than the problem itself. You can't solve the, some, the funding, prob, funding problem without solving the organization problem. So, so I would say if, some, if I were to run an organization and enter an organization where I feel that the organization has a funding problem, you know, who has the best idea about what's, ha what, what's happening in the organization? Not someone outside like me, but the people who are working in the organization. So I would probably call a meeting and say, you know what, we are facing this issue. What, what should we do about it? And then they will start talking. When they start talking, listen. Listen, even if you have a greater idea than they have, Listen, implement what has come out first. If something worked out very well, acknowledge, you know, you know, thanks, thanks, that was a very good idea that worked out for us. And then you contribute your ideas and let your ideas, irrespective of your hierarchy in the team, have the same equal. And it is one of the most difficult things to do is because when you are heading an organization, when you project your idea, that idea tends to have a higher weight than anybody else's idea only because of the positional power that you occupy in that organization. So it's one of the most difficult things is to, is to, is to be training yourself to listen to asking people, what should we do? What do you think we can do? Listening, implementing, acknowledging, keep doing it and and then put out an idea. Then when you put out an idea out there, it could be accepted as one part of the ideas and not the idea that's been floated on by the boss. Okay. Um, the fourth one um, is routines, rituals, repetition. That's what I keep saying is that most organizations that I know keep doing work and keep doing a lot of varied work. 
you know, if anybody has studied Six Sigma or any student Lean Sigma, you'd understand that variation is actually a problem, you know. So make, make your work week fairly simple. Your business model must be simple, repeatable, scalable. But first it has to be simple. If you try to do a lot of things, you're not going to be successful. Find, find something that is simple to do, whatever the business case. Let's say you have a funding model. Find a simple funding model. It may work, may not work. But, if, but having a lot of things is a sure recipe of not working. Okay. Find routines. For example, we have Monday morning calls, for example. You know, many organizations follow that. You know, routines could be, routines make life easy. So for example, if you have salaries to be paid, and it, it all has to be paid one day at once, the salaries can be automated on your banking system. So you can you have to create several routines. Find how much of your day-to-day -day work can be, routed, can be created into routines. Uh, where technology can help and sometimes it's not it's not technology it's just human beings coming together and talking about it so it could be routines it could be uh, rituals that you have for example do you celebrate uh, each other's successes do you celebrate uh, each other's uh, birthdays or anniversaries you know you the more you treat your team as a family the more the team becomes a powerful team um, and repetition, keep doing what's working throughout. Why, why complicate it? Okay. And the fifth one is coaching, mentoring your staff. Uh, this is far, far, far more powerful and actually works than actually um, doing, um, I don't know, appraisals. You know? Uh, work with everybody who in your team and see how you can add value to your, that person, the person's life. Um, in one of the, for example, for me, it's fairly simple. If people don't go home at five o'clock in the evening, I know that there is a bigger problem at hand. Okay. So I expect people to work 40 hours a week, not more, not less. And, uh, and I know that when I, without me, people are working at one o'clock, two o'clock. And I don't like that, you know, it's because if there's something, if, if people can't do work in the allotted time that they have, that means there is a bigger issue that is getting, um, hidden the business model is not working or the, the the product is not developed good enough or the service qualities are not good enough there is leakages happening you know so uh, so that's what i would say is uh, coaching mentoring your staff um, far more than criticizing giving them negative feedback Works, works far more. I'm not even talking about what's good and what's wrong. I'm just talking about what works. You know. Um, I don't know how many of you have all heard the word VUCA and this, this was invented 10, 15 years back and I think it's kind of post, uh, that word has become more of a cliche right now. But, uh, but you know, VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Okay. So, if I release that our modern world is characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, something which was not present 25 years before. You know? So, what the models do we have to live in this VUCA world? So, you know, I've been thinking about it, and that's the few things that I think are, you know, what will work in this in this modern world to counter volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity is one the courage to be vulnerable, the courage to be a leader and say, you know, I really don't know the solution to this problem or being vulnerable and saying, you know what, I'm, um, uh, I'm sorry, I got very angry with you. I should not have got very angry. With you. Being vulnerable, being open to criticism, being open to saying, I don't know, having the courage to be doing that. Uh, understanding, now understanding is most times we tend to, be very action oriented, which is a good thing in itself, but without really understanding what's 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 at stake, you know. And understanding doesn't have to be, um, uh, doesn't have to be only analytical, not in that sense, but understanding also uh, what does your instinct tell, what is your what is your belief system, what's your value system, what does your heart really say should be done. You know, understanding in the in the wholeness of it. Um, the third thing is community, and this is something that I 
uh, I would say I'm, I'm fairly biased towards is there's a lot of individualism right now. And I think the answer is to move from individualism to a sense of community. Your work, work people at work, or work unit are a community. And how can we support each other, not just at work, but what we are going through in our lives um, is important. And it's important and it's one of the ways in which you can address the problems of uncertainty that we all face in our lives or volatility in our face in our lives. Um, and especially when I see a lot of young people in the social sector, nowadays who are attracted to the social sector, want to be part of the social sector, either through voluntary or through, or through working as employees in an organization or starting their own organizations. Uh, I fear sometimes that they are very... Um, I would say individualistic or they're trying to seek solutions on their own. And I think a simpler, safer approach is to just band together, you know, to take care of each other. Um, authenticity is, 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 is um, I would say the cornerstone of what, what I just spoke about is to be, is to be living inside, to be comfortable in your own truth, you know, um, so this is my experience, meaning I can, give, I can give you more examples if this was not concrete enough, uh, but this is what I, what I wanted to say.